this is Azam. Um, Azam's about 40 years old. He lives in Kabul, in Afghanistan. And Azam's a sweet maker. A couple of times a week, he goes to the market. He buys raw sugar, colorings, and dyes. He goes back to his workshop, and with his cousins, he makes sweets. They boil up the sugar and experiment a little bit. He's kind of like an Afghan Willy Wonka. <laughs> During his life, Azam's lived under a number of regimes and governments uh, in, Af in Kabul. He's lived under the, the rule of the Afghan kings, uh, under the Soviet regime after the Russian invasion. He's lived under the crushing civil war that destroyed maybe three quarters of the buildings in Kabul. He's lived under the strict Islamic regime of the Taliban, and now under the fragile democracy uh, brought by the international community. When I met Azam four years ago, I asked him, what was the best time for you in Kabul? And he told me, he said, James, it was under the Taliban. Business was great. In those days, there were no Snickers bars. <laughs> and I'm, I'm a guide, and I arrange trips to parts of the world that people don't often visit, including Afghanistan. And a large part of my job is to tell stories like Azam's, to break down cliches and stereotypes, and to show the countries that I guide my guests in as the complex and multifaceted places that they really are. And for Azam, earning money to feed his family is more important than any ideology. But you won't find a recording of Azam's story on YouTube. You won't be able to locate his workshop on Google Earth. His story hasn't been reported on the BBC or CNN. And he's yet to give a TED talk. <laughs> But, and sorry, this has gone in the <laughs> wrong direction. Um, and my job is, um, and it was, it was telling stories like Azam's that led me uh, to be a, a tour guide in Afghanistan. Uh, the other reason I wanted to become a tour guide was to try and do something for the country. I'm not the, the first person, and I won't be the last person that's, that's fallen in love um, with a country. And Afghanistan's mix of epic landscape and uh, tough, honourable, albeit occasionally brutal people had a great attraction for me. Um, and the place where I began to move towards doing this kind of work was a place called uh, Bamiyan in central Afghanistan. It's the name of a town and also the name of, uh, of a province. It's about eight hours drive west of, of Kabul. And the province of Bamiyan has some of Afghanistan's most incredible sites. Sites like the lapis lazuli blue lakes at Bandi Amir, where I take people every year. But also people from Kabul come up to escape the heat in the summer and pedal around in these swan-shaped boats. Bamiyan was also famous because for 1,500 years, the world's largest Buddha statues stood in cliffs overlooking the town of Bamiyan. And we can still see here the niche where the 60 meter high Buddha statue stood. Sadly, these statues were destroyed in 2001. And all that's left in that niche that we saw is the left foot of the large Buddha. And this history and this landscape was amazing. I wanted to show people this. Um, but it was really a meeting with a man called Abdul, who was a UN translator. That, that pushed me even further towards this kind of work. I met Abdul in a, in a trikhana, in a tea house, in Bamiyan. Um, he spoke English very well, and at the time my dowry was, was almost non-existent. And we chatted over a few days, and after a couple of days he said to me, James, we should start a development agency. And I was in my sort of first flush of love for the country, and I said, hey, Abdul, this is great. What, what does Bamiyan need? What can we do for Bamiyan? And he said, he said, James, Bamiyan needs education. Or women's rights. Or human rights. Or legal aid. But we should, we should start a development agency. 
And it kind of dawned on me that this, this, this was the country I was in, where the two pillars of the economy were either smuggling drugs or, um, or, or, or the aid money coming in, where people like Abdul, an educated entrepreneur, was just trying to find um, smarter ways to get some of this um, development dollars. Um, it was a country where some of the best doctors and engineers and teachers uh, were working as translators uh, for embassies and for development agencies because that's where they could earn more money. And it was a country where a province like Bamiyan had 10 agencies building primary schools that sometimes lay empty, but no one was creating electricity. No one was building a prison. No one was building uh, a san any sanitation because if someone's asking for you to collect money, you're not going to donate to a prison or to a sewage pipe. You're going to donate to a school. And I'm not trying to knock these development agencies. I, I meet a lot of them in my, in my travels. And almost to a person, they're much more educated than I am. They're much more intelligent than I am. And almost to a man, they're much more hardworking than I am. And so um, I... But I, but I felt that if I bring people to countries like Afghanistan and I try and show them the stories behind the headlines, they would also bring some income. It would be a very small amount of income, but the income wouldn't come with any conditions. It would just be serving people, driving my guests, and um, putting them up in accommodation and feeding them. And as I began to guide people in Afghanistan, I realized, well, my guests did come. They did see behind the headlines. They did bring income. But they brought something more than that. And the best way I can describe this is through the, the, the ski trips that I run um, to Afghanistan. Now, when I first considered running ski trips to Afghanistan, not only did I wonder whether I could do it, I wondered whether I should do it. It felt to me a bit kind of colonial, turning up with all this high-tech equipment, expensive equipment, one of the world's least developed countries. I didn't really think I, whether it was something that was, um, that was worthwhile. Um, but I had a friend called Ken, and Ken was a, a Scottish expat from Kabul. And Ken would often go um, on weekends in the winter um, with a group of French lads here to the Salang Pass, three hours drive north of Kabul. And he told me that if I was serious about being a tour guide, a tour operator in Afghanistan, I should run some ski trips. So I, had to, so I said to him, fine, next time I'm in Kabul in the winter, we go on a little uh, a ski trip together. And we did so. I was in charge of the, the transportation, and I contacted my friend uh, Ali, who often works with me as a driver when I'm in Afghanistan. And trying to explain to Ali what skiing meant when he'd never seen skiing and never seen skis was a bit tricky but when he turned up with the van we loaded the skis in the poles explained we were going out in the mountains all day the, the penny kind of dropped and we we started off early in the morning and we drove towards the salang and we stopped at a, at a chai khana a tea house and um chai means tea khana is house and now you probably know about as much dowry as i did when i first went to afghanistan and at the chai khana ali went in and ordered his breakfast. Now, any Afghan will tell you that if you're going to be out in the mountains all day, in the snow, working hard, there's only one thing you want for breakfast, and that's cow foot. And cow foot is the foot of a cow. It's mainly bone, but there's a bit of fat, sinew, gristle thrown in. And as this was served up and the, the French skiers that were there were giving me the sort of evil eye about having arranged this, I, I decided that if we were going to do commercial skiing in Afghanistan, then Ali wouldn't be in charge of, of the catering. <laughs> but soon we got to the, 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 the road, got our skis on, and headed up. Now, Ken, I might not have mentioned, but Ken's a very good skier. And he and the French lads went to the, the very top of, of the peaks we can see there. Now, I'm, I'm not such a proficient skier. I went to sort of the edge of this flat area, came back, falling over only you know, three or four times, and came back to, to Ali. And as Ali and I sat there in his, in his van with my binoculars, we watched Ken come flying down the slopes at great speed. And Ali was in awe. He said, he's a jinn. A jinn is a, is a ghost or a, or a spirit. And Ali believes that in the mountains there are still spirits. Um, 
And I certainly started getting the feeling that maybe, you know, skiing is something that other people can enjoy, not just the, uh, the foreigners coming here. But what really made me believe in it was when we got back to the Chaikana after the skiing. And Ali regaled everyone with our exploits on the, on the slopes. And in traditional um, Afghan uh, style, he exaggerated outrageously, uh, describing Ken as a jinn, literally, literally flying down the slopes. And he described me as a, as a boz, as a goat. <laughs> now, originally I hoped it was about my sort of nimble footedness amongst the, amongst the rocks, but it was more to do with my erratic skiing style. But I wasn't the only one who thought that skiing might be interesting and, and purposeful um, by introducing it to Afghanistan. A, uh, the Aga Khan Foundation, a development agency, and a, a Swiss journalist called Christoph uh, introduced a ski program in Bamiyan in Afghanistan. And it's a training program to train uh, some local lads into the, with the basics of skiing um, so that they can guide my guests and also some of the expats from Kabul and also basic ski repair. But they also train, are trained in avalanche detection, avalanche prevention, avalanche rescue, first aid, wilderness survival skills. And in these small villages where avalanches kill 100 or 200 people a year in Afghanistan, these are skills that can potentially save lives. And this is, this is all very worthy, this is, this is great. But what excited me, what really interested me was that once I and others started skiing in the, in the small valleys around Bamiyan, was that the local guys took interest in skiing, but they didn't have any equipment, so they built their own. And guys like this made skis out of planks of wood and battered uh, tin cans for edges. They made rudimentary bindings out of pieces of string and chains. And, this, and their, uh, their poles were just made out of sticks. And for me, that's what's important. That not only do my guests that come to Afghanistan have fun and have amazing experiences, and not only do my guests that come to Afghanistan uh, get to see some of the stories behind the headlines, but these guys also get to see the international community in a rounded way. In the same way that Azam, the sweet maker, preferred life under, under the Taliban, but that doesn't make him... Um, necessarily a Taliban sympathizer, these guys see my skiers not as occupiers of their country, not as saviors of their country, but just as people having fun in the snow. And that's a bit of an obsession with mine whenever I guide in Afghanistan, is that we have an obligation, the groups that I guide have an obligation to, to entertain um, and to exchange ideas. And it's, it's, it's equally important that the people we visit enjoy the trips as much as the people that I bring. Because there's an old uh, environmental tagline that says, take only photos and leave only footprints. But that's not possible. Uh, we don't live in a vacuum. Whenever we go somewhere, we we'll leave something. Uh, but the aim and the challenge is that what we leave is something worthwhile. Thank you very much.